In 1834, Thomas and Jane Carlyle left their remote moorland home in Scotland and came to London to seek their fortune. They rented this house in Cheney Row, in what was then unfashionable Chelsea, for just £35 a year. Here, Thomas wrote his most famous works, including his History of the French Revolution, and the couple entertained the most prominent literary figures of the Victorian age. As custodian of Carlyle's house, I think it's my job to help visitors understand the story of this fascinating couple, Thomas and Jane Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle and Jane Welsh Carlyle really worked as a team from a social point of view. And this house in Cheney Row was a place of pilgrimage, not only for literary people and political figures and philosophers in Britain, but all over the world. People came from America, people came from Europe to see the great Carlyle, the sage of Chelsea. I suspect if it weren't for Carlyle's house, very few people today would have a clue that they ever existed. And this wonderful time capsule with their, their be below their pictures, their furniture, uh, which is more or less, I think, as it was when Carlyle died in 1881, is the most incredible act of preservation uh, of the life of, of, of two people, Obviously, Jane, his wife, they both lived here from 1834, but Carlyle spent 47 years, the last 47 years of his life here. And this house is not just a, a, a living memorial to both Carlyles. It is a reminder that, that they both existed and a temptation or an incentive to go and read what they both wrote. He was the most famous writer, of course, but she wrote fantastic letters and one of the best letter writers of the 19th century. And this house reminds us to go and read their work. I think Carlyle and the other um, thinkers around him essentially created a template for the way we argue about most of the problems we still confront, uh, whether it's welfare, uh, politics, uh, the influence of um, uh, money, materialism, um, machines, all of that is um, essentially the same debate. When Thomas and Jane first met, she told him she wanted to become a famous writer. He said that he could help her to write, but to forget about fame. Her contribution to the marriage was to take on all the household chores and make sure that he wasn't worried by anything. Although over the years that they were here, many people came to visit her as much as Thomas, because she was a great wit and a great hostess. If you lived in the Victorian age and you were anybody at all, really, with uh, intellectual or political interests, the likelihood is that you would visit this house in Cheney Row. It was central to Victorian intellectual life. And the Carlyles, in all their strangeness and eccentricity, uh, were here to be experienced, both as uh, figures of the mind and as social figures, as writers or in his case a writer and has a writer's assistant, uh, and as people that you'd meet and joke with, they were very funny. And so this house is absolutely central to the intellectual history of Great Britain in the 19th century. And I don't think if it had been dismantled, we would have lost something really fundamental about the Victorians. I think particularly now that Carlyle isn't read so widely, it's particularly important that this place is kept going as a monument to all that he stood for. In the mid-19th century, Carlyle was probably the foremost thinker of his time. He was revered by writers such as Charles Dickens, George Eliot, uh, but also by thinkers such as Matthew Arnold and, to an extent, until they fell out, John Stuart Mill. So he was enormously significant. I would imagine if you met Carlyle, um, you might be charmed or you might be infuriated. Um, and it depends what period of his life you got him. He seems to have turned from enfant terrible into terrific old bore. But then that happens to us all. What was Thomas Carlyle like as a man? He was a very good-looking person. He was an arrestingly handsome, uh, raw-boned, tall, bearded Scotsman. He had a very funny, very distinctive way of speaking. The Scottish accent was so strong that many people found it difficult to understand the first few sentences. And um, he was great fun to be with, though I think probably a little bit frightening. 
I think Carlyle and those around him were, were a huge influence on his contemporaries. Um, whether they agreed with him or they found his views appalling, uh, he generated a reaction. Uh, he was impossible to ignore. Carlyle was a very difficult man. He was what today we would probably term borderline Asperger's. He loved ranting. He would deliver 20 or 30 minute monologues to his guests and not invite them to participate. But he was a very thoughtful man. He was immensely well read. He reflected deeply on the problems of, of his country and of the world. And he had various ideologies, such as the great man theory of history, which he was determined to propagate. And above all, he was very, very hard working. He was enormously industrious and turned out an enormous amount of work. It's a fairly obvious point, but the only way you could communicate in the 19th century with somebody was either talking to them or writing them letters. The Carlyles had this routine of being apart for much of the summer. He went back to his own folk in Scotland, and Jane remained behind in this house and cleaned it from top to bottom and, uh, and did all the house rearrangements and cleaned the curtains and so forth. So we know quite a lot about their relationship because, uh, unlike many married couples, they wrote a lot to one another during that period. It was a difficult marriage. They were both very strong characters. Uh, they were combative, they quarrelled, but they also, at some deep level, were partners and loved one another. And so I think that their letters, both of which are brilliant on both sides, tell us an awful lot about that complicated relationship. They also wrote to lots and lots of other people. Carlyle himself was in constant touch with all the great intellectuals of the world. Uh, Goethe, when you read the conversations of Goethe, the great German, Noel, uh, when he was an old man, he was always looking forward to another letter from the sage of Chelsea, who was himself a very young man at that stage. Carlyle was in touch with everybody. Jane wrote these much chattier letters, but they were also highly intelligent and brilliant prose works. When Carlyle lived here for nearly 50 years, he rented the house for £35 a year. So when both he and Jane had died, the empty house went back to the landlord. A group of admirers raised the money through public subscription and opened it as the Shrine to Carlisle in 1895. They continued to run it until 1936 when the National Trust took it over and the only reason that they took the house on was because Octavia Hill, one of the founders of the National Trust, was a great admirer of Carlisle and she pledged her support to the house. What is good about coming here to Cheney Row is that you can test out Carlyle's own theory that when he was writing about someone he would surround himself by the objects, pictures, um, artefacts connected with that person. So here you can immerse yourself in Carlyle's world and see if it works. For more information please visit our website 